Alright, chapter 9, pain management during labor and birth. Okay, so pain is subjective, it's individual, it's sensory experience, and it is whatever the patient says it is. There are many factors that influence the way a client perceives pain, and we're going to go through those and break them down in this slideshow. There's physiological, there's psychological, there's emotional, there's environmental, there is also so sociocultural. Pain of labor and childbirth. It is more unique than any other type of pain. It's different from all other types of pain. Increased in intensity, it's a desired thing, it's a positive thing, and it occurs in a very predictable pattern. You know pretty well when those contractions are gonna be coming on, you know how long they're gonna last. It's very predictable. Um, like I said, it's very unique. It's very different from any other pain. There's YouTube videos out there of men that they stimulated the same kind of pain um, of having a birth, child labor pain on, and they're hilarious videos. You need to check them out. I think I posted them on your Blackboard page as well because it's just funny. It's something you can't really explain or describe, but anyways. Uh, the physiologic physi physiology and characteristics of labor and birth pain. Different origin points depending on the stage of the labor and different characteristics. So at first, initially, you have that first stage. And there's pain from the cervix, the lower uterine region seg segments. It's lower pain. It's um, characteristics like some other pains you felt before. It's diffuse in nature, occurs in the lower abdomen, and it may be referred to the lower bat, back or buttocks or thighs. Um, different origination points depending on the stage of the labor and different characteristics. Again, going to the second stage of labor, pain from the perineum and birth canal describes as coming in waves. And then birth, it's a burning pain in the perineum described as the most extreme pain. And for the perineum, you can go back to page 51 and check. That is the area right between the vaginal wall and the rectum. And so look at that. That's also where if the patient rips or tears or if they have to do an episiotomy and cut, that is the area in which they are cutting, which they are tearing. And there can be um, profuse pain through that segment. Okay, so factors influence labor pain. It's multi-dimensional experience, psychological. You think of the level of the woman's fear and the anxiety and the woman's culture too. Has she come from somewhere where women prepared her for this um, type of pain? They've encouraged her to use breathing techniques, relaxation techniques. They've showed her, told her what it's gonna be like. And so she kind of goes into it with some understanding. And then the circumstances surrounding the, the birth experience. Is it good circumstances? Is everyone joyful, happy? Is it a stress relationship? What is taking place? What is going on in the psyche of the mom and those around her as well? Physiological, it's a phy physical condition of the woman and it's a natural condition of a pregnant woman. Um, we can use pharmacological methods, which we'll talk about, and then the age of the woman, how old is she, is she older, you know, those younger women tend to kind of pop them out a little bit easier, it's easier on their bodies than an older woman, and then the length of the labor experience, of course she might be doing great and feeling good at first, um, but then after 23 hours of labor, she's getting tired, her body's getting tired, and she's kind of done. Okay, general concepts of pain. The pain threshold. This is the level of pain necessary for an individual to perceive pain. So pain threshold is when you first start experiencing pain. Pain tolerance is the ability of an individual to withstand the pain once it's recognized. So once it's recognized, how much pain are you able to stand? That is your pain tolerance. Principles of pain relief during labor, labor. Women are more satisfied when they have control over the pain experience. And so up front in those prenatal visits when they're coming in and we're talking with them, we want to talk about pain options. We want to talk about all the options before they ever get 
go into labor so they know what's out there and they know kind of what their plan is that goes into a birth plan do you want an epidural or do you want to know the other options so as long as a woman can have some kind of control over the pain she's going to feel she is more control in her body and she's going to have a better experience with that caregivers commonly underrate the severity of the pain so as nurses a lot of times we'll look at a woman and we'll think oh my gosh is she really in that much pain how can she be in that much pain but again, pain is always subjective. And no, as caregivers, we do commonly underrate the severity of pain. So be careful with that. Women are prepared for labor usually report a more satisfying experience than those women who are not prepared. So make sure she knows what she's kind of going into before she gets there. Non-pharmacological pain interventions, you can have continuous labor support. And this is often good whenever you have um, a doula, a birthing coach, something along that who can offer that continuous um, labor support. In the hospital, you're not going to see that much because the nurses will have more of a two to one pa uh, patient ratio. So they can't always be there continuously with you. If that is something the woman wants, we might refer her to um, a midwife or someone like that who can give more of that support. Comfort measures, there's many, many different comfort, comfort measures that we can talk about, whether it's breathing, attention focus, imagery, movement, positioning, touch, massage, water therapy, hypnosis, all of those go into relaxation techniques and comfort measures, whether it's giving her a pillow, turning her on her side, things like that. And whenever you're thinking about um, any kind of pain management, we're always thinking least invasive first. Can we reposition her? Can we turn her on her side? Can we give her a heat or a massage? What about a pill? If the pill doesn't work, maybe we'll give her an injection. Okay, and a lot of times these relaxation techniques will work really good on early labor, but not so much in the second stage. Okay, so now we're moving on to non-pharmacological pain interventions. There are some um, natural, more non-pharmacological things we can do for these women. Intradermal water injections, injections is one of those, and you'll find more information about that on page 190. There, it's four injections of sterile water, and this is really good about about relieving back pain. It doesn't do much for um, contractions in the stomach or anything like that, but it will relieve back pain. And typically it'll last about 45 to 120 minutes. So it gives the woman a little bit of relief. Acupressure, acu acupuncture, those things are good as well. Of course, as nurses, we won't necessarily be the ones um, administering that or doing that. So again, if they're interested in that, they need to have a doula, a midwife, someone else who can do those things for them. The intradermal water injections, yes, we can do that and sometimes the doctor will order that. Advantages and disadvantages of non-pharmacological interventions. Some of the advantages, they're non-invasive. Of course, with injection it is invasive, but most of them can be very non-invasive. They address the emotional and spiritual aspects of birth, and they promote the woman's sense of control over the pain. The disadvantages are going to be that most of these interventions require special training and practice before they ever get in a birthing situation. And a lot of these methods are not um, effective for every woman. In a in sedation, the use of medication to reduce the sensation of pain. Sedatives are given to promote sedation and relaxation. Opioids are given to promote analgesia during uh, labor, and that's just reducing that sensation of pain. So ideally, we would love a medicine that would provide excellent pain relief to the mother and still allow her to get up, ambulate, and um, freely change positions. At the same time, we would love a medication that did not cross the uh, placenta and um, it wouldn't have any severe side effects to the newborn baby. That would be ideal. However, most of these medications, it's not like that. So, with 
analgesia, you have um, the narcotics, you have the fentanyl, the Demerol, things like that. Anesthesia is the use of medication to partially or totally block all sensation to an area. And with that, you have local anesthesia, regional or general, and we'll get into that. The advantages and disadvantages of opioid administration. The advantages are an increased ability for the woman to cope with the labor. It takes off that edge of the pain, and so she's able to cope better. The medications may be nurse administered, which is always a plus. Um, and then the disadvantages are gonna be frequent occurrence of uncomfortable side effects, such as nausea, vomiting, itching, drowsiness, neonatal depression. We have to be watching to see what kind of effects um, the baby is having, what kind of changes in the fetus's heart rate and things like that because these things do cross the placenta. And then pain is not eliminated completely. Okay, so types of anesthesia. The local anesthesia is going to be used to numb the perineum just before birth to allow for an episiotomy and repair. So this is actually going in right to the vagina wall with a needle injecting her so it just numbs up that perineum um, and that's either because they're going to have to cut her with an episiotomy and make that hole larger or maybe she tore and they're going to have to go in and stitch her up so they'll give a local anesthesia. Regional anesthesia involves blocking a group of sensory nerves that supply a particular organ or area in the body and when you're looking at regional you are going to be thinking um, non-emergency c-section that's what they like to use whenever um, it's not an emergency c-section general anesthesia it is not used frequently in obstetrics because of the risk involved however if we were in an emergency c-section whether it was the life of the mom the life of the baby emergency we have to get that baby out quickly that is when we would do, use general anesthesia but you won't see that too often Hopefully you won't see that at all. <coughs> okay, so types of regional anesthesia. You have the pitendal block, which that is like assistive delivery and it's pain relief prior to birth. You have the paracervical, which works during the first stage of pregnancy, I mean the first stage of labor. However, it cannot be used after she is dilated to a 10. You have the epidural anesthesia, which is gonna block the pain sensation. Um, this is talking about epidurals and it will be injected into the epidural space. Local anesthesia, opioids can be used with it. And then you have intrathecal anesthesia and this is actually given, it's a one-time dose. It's given into the same catheter as the epidural. However, it is um, injected into the spinal area so it works a lot quicker and it kind of gives you relief until the epidural starts working. Um, any facility that has um, administers regional anesthesia also has to be able to have emergency equipment available like intubation, cardiac monitoring, and emergency medications. So if any hospital is going to be giving regional anesthesia, they also have to be able to do um, emergency life support, things like that. Okay, so with the regional anesthesia, remember it blocks a group of sensory nerves. Some of the complications associated with an epidural or spinal anesthesia is going to be hypotension. And this is a very big one. And before you can ever even get an epidural, they are going to be giving that woman um, lots and lots of fluids, about a 500 to a 2,000 liter bolus of fluid. They have to get at least a liter in her before they'll agree to do a um, epidural on her. Uh, maternal fever, shivering, these are just some side effects you'll see with this. She'll be shivering, she won't be cold or anything, but she'll just be shaking and she can't control it. Paritis, any kind of itching, inadvert injection to the bloodstream, a spinal headache, and fetal distress. So we're watching all of these things. With the spinal headache, they will do a blood patch, and that's the only way to get rid of it. And that's going back and injecting 10 to 20 mils of the woman's blood into that epidural space, and that's called a blood patch. You can read more about that on page 196. Okay, so talking with general anesthesia, 
It is not often used in obstetrics because of the risk involved. The pregnant woman is at higher risk for aspiration. It requires a more skilled person to intubate a pregnant woman because of all the physiological changes in the trachea and the thorax. The drug will also cross over to cross through the placenta to the baby, and that can cause um, the baby to be severely depressed and require full resuscitation. Um, aspiration is a huge problem with the pregnant woman as well. She is at higher risk for aspiration. A lot of times they'll give her medication um, beforehand to antacids, an IV, to decrease this risk. And then also as the RN, you, um, the RN can give cricoid pressure with the thumb and the forefinger over the cricoid cartilage in the trachea, which will close off the esophagus and decrease the risk of aspiration. Malignant hypothermia, that is a very rare but potentially life-threatening um, complication of general anesthesia, and its inherited condition causes sustained muscle contractions in the presence of certain anesthetic agents. So it's very rare, but at the same time, we have to do a thorough history to make sure that that woman is not at risk for that. Um, Afterwards, there are early signs that she could be develop, developing malignant hypothermia, and it would be muscle rigidity, tachycardia, irregular heartbeats, decreased oxygen sats, cyanosis, body temperature can rapidly increase the lethal lef levels. Um, however, that would be kind of a late sign. So those are also things we have to worry about and look with, with general anesthesia. Like I said, Usually we don't use it, so it's not too big of a problem, but still, if we do, it can be life-threatening.